<laughs> nice to see you all and you're very welcome to this panel on the impact of natural history programming on uh, our planet. Um, I'm really thrilled with our panel this <coughs> evening. They are perfectly placed to help us understand the challenges ahead, but also to help shed light on some of the stickier issues around sustainability in natural history output. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Wendy Dark, who is obviously, of course, the former head of the Natural History Unit at BBC Studios and founder, CEO and exec producer of her indie Truth to Nature. Doug Allen is an award-winning wildlife and expedition cameraman, filmmaker and author, and it's so good to have him here this evening. We have okay. also Christina Turner. She's a, an assistant producer and the co-founder of a brilliant organization I'm sure some of you at least would have heard about, Filmmakers for Future Wildlife. Very exciting things going on there. And then last but not least, Tom Mustill, natural history producer, writer and filmmaker, at Gripping Films. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we were having a bit of a, of a natter in the green room and there's lots to talk about. Um, it's an important topic and um, you've, also got so, you've all got some great insights to share with us this evening. Wendy, I might start with the, a bit of a humding or of a question with you, if, if I may, because of your incredible experience in, in this genre. And we know that natural history <coughs> is enjoying a real boon um, the all the platforms are, are getting involved in big landmark natural history programs, all the streamers. So what's your take on how the natural history programming ecosystem is looking like presently when it comes to sustainability goals? Mm. Well, thank you, Liz, and very good evening to everybody. Um, I think it's, it's a real bittersweet. Uh, when I started in the industry 30 years ago, uh, premium nature or nature shows were... were always kind of held their own, but somewhat peripheral alongside other genres. And of course now, nature for lots of good reasons, but also for some reasons we'll be touching on later, has become very center stage and mainstream. And that's obviously now brought in, like you said, to the, the streamers, the Netflix, the Apples, um, uh, Disney Plus, which from a program making perspective is, it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, a lot of those shows will get seen by 500 million people. So as a responsible filmmaker, that is a huge opportunity to connect people both here in the UK and to the wider world to tell stories that you are passionate about, about the natural world. And I feel as responsible filmmakers, what we'll be talking about this evening is how we can move with the times to make sure we're delivering premium shows that are engaging with purpose, with messaging, but also in an entertainment environment. And the question you said about how are the new um, entrants responding to sustainability, mm. um, I work with a, a mixture both of public service and, and streamers, um, Sky being one of them, and I would say they are by far the world leaders in sustainability, net zero carbon for 2030. They've been doing it for 15 years. Um, so their culture and a lot of the initiatives are definitely um, a real kind of, I use the word beacon for hope for us to learn from and build on and capitalise on, still a, a mountain to climb. Uh, Netflix likewise coming slightly later but very much now doing catch up uh, which is really interesting to see. Um, and obviously Charlotte and the team at BBC and elsewhere, I really don't think there's anywhere to hide for all the reasons that the, it's in the headlines every day. And I think as filmmakers, our job as well is to come up with great innovative ideas, is to challenge broadcasters, streamers, to come on the journey with us to make a better, healthier future, both for the natural world, for us, and use our storytelling uh, content production um, to get those messages out there and engage all audiences of all ages across the world. So it's an exciting time with lots of opportunities for the taking, both off screen and on screen, if we get things right. Tom, just to get a bit of context about you, because you are pretty well known in the industry for um, early on making the decision to tackle sustainability issues head on with regards to how you would make programs going forward. Just to get a bit of an idea of how you got to that point, what led you to decide that's where you were going to take your career? What inspired you? What were the biggest challenges? That kind of thing. Just that kind of thing? Fact, the whole thing, your whole life story <laughs> basically, please. Um, I guess um, I, like many people in wildlife film, I came from a conservation or science background. And so entering, uh, uh, I just thought it was really cool that I got to go and make films about conservation biologists. And then as I spent more and more time in the industry, I started to realize what an industry it was. 
And I started looking at all the Peli cases in the airports and all looking at all of us getting our air miles cards out to get extra flights from getting on flights. And I started to realize that there was a bit of a, I mean, it sounds silly now, but you know, at the time it just felt so natural just to try and fly as much as we could and to just get whatever kit we wanted. And I started to feel very uneasy with my own footprint. I wasn't really living in my uh, film life and my production life, the kind of life that I felt we should all be getting towards um, uh, in our personal lives and, pro and professional lives. So, but I was really lucky because I got opportunities to direct and then uh, on standalone films. And I, and I feel like if you're in a big landmark expensive film, it's very hard to make it move unless you can point at other people who've tried what, you're, what, you, what you'd like to do and de-risked it, perhaps on a smaller scale. So I thought if I tried to work out some solutions to these problems that we all face and we're all feeling uncomfortable about, that might make it easier for the bigger productions to say, well, they did it and they didn't go under and the film wasn't boring. You know, let's try that too. So, um, well, uh, the, mo the most useful thing that happened was a, a whale jumped out of the sea and landed on top of me when I was kayaking and that went viral because someone filmed it. And that meant that nobody else could tell that story and then I could kind of do whatever I wanted in the telling of that story once I got a commission. So I worked with Albert to make it like the first, Albert is the kind of industry sustainability uh, program and they do a carbon calculator but they also help you look at other elements of your storytelling. And just worked with all the different members of the team to try and reduce our, our footprint in carbon and other things as kind of an experiment. And I guess what I've been doing ever since is intrigued by how that experiment worked out and how fun it was and how easy some of it was and how there were like weird, unexpected benefits. I've just been trying other little experiments in the hope that my contribution can be like, hey guys, look, this wasn't so bad. Actually, this was quite fun. Um, and then the bigger beasts that don't have the luxury of just turning on a dime can go, oh look, they did it. It's, it's safe, we can walk across here too. Brilliant. And, and Doug, you have had and continue to have the, one of the most incredible careers in natural history <laughs> filmmaking, it has to be said. It's such an illustrious one. Tell me a little bit about how you've witnessed the conversation change, evolve around sustainability and how you feel we've been tackling it to date. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I worked steadily on the big um, BBC blue chips until really planet Earth and towards frozen planet. But then I deliberately took a step aside from them because I felt um, that they just weren't addressing any of the issues at all. I kept you know, asking, um, I can't remember if, if I asked Wendy when she was head of the unit, but I certainly asked Julian, you know, can we do programs more directed at climate change, for example, never got anywhere. So I made a distinct decision around about 2012 or something to actually leave all the pure wildlife stuff behind. And I went and worked for people called Living Oceans Foundation, um, who are a coral reef conservation body in, in America. And it's interesting, the director of communications at um, Living Oceans Foundation at that time was Alison Barrett, who is now the chief commissioning editor for Love Nature Channel. And Love Nature Channel are one of the few big channels that, that, that genuinely pushes money into conservation projects which are featured in their films. So Alison's always been very interested in that, you know, getting to the heart and making conservation programmes. And, um, and we tried to, well, I don't know if we were sustainable, to be honest, at Living Oceans Foundation, because it was largely funded by a Saudi Arabian prince. Um, so you've got to be careful what you say. Um, and I think one thing we have to be careful about here is, is in this discussion is to distinguish between conservation and climate change. Because if we don't control climate change, all the conservation in the world will be irrelevant. Um, and so, you know, I would like to see, you know, much bigger efforts being made, not only sustainability within the programmes and the programme making, but a much more powerful message coming out of the programmes to, to, to move the needle, not amongst all, not to continue preaching to the converted, but to get other people on board. There is still an amazing amount of ignorance out there in the world in general about climate change and about how serious it is. We're going to flesh that out later because yeah, we sure. all feel very strongly about that. Yep. A very good point, Doug. Thank you. Christina, before I speak to you, we're going to show a little film from uh, Filmmakers for Future Wildlife. Take a look. Wildlife 
filmmaking has a duty to report on the true state of the natural world. We must reduce the carbon footprint of our films, even if it takes more time. We need more diversity and collaboration at every stage of the filmmaking process. incredibly powerful film and I watched it in preparation for this panel and I felt compelled to tweet it because the person who said I feel eco-anxiety when I'm making programs I don't talk about the crisis really spoke to me that's how I feel and I got really emotional about it actually so well done on that film and many others on your website tell me a little bit more about filmmakers uh, for future for uh, wildlife how you got involved because you're the co-founder of the organization aren't you one, one of them yeah thanks um yeah, basically, we um, formed at the end of 2019 as a response to the climate and biodiversity crisis. And we basically wanted a place um, for anyone involved with wildlife filmmaking to come together and explore opportunities that we're not tapping into yet with our content. So um, just maximizing what we could do as an industry to help the situation. Um, so we, we're all about collaboration and we aim to encourage that across three main themes. So um, exploring ways to reduce our footprint, to make more impactful content that actually inspires change, and also <coughs> to move away from the traditional, quite extractive model of filmmaking. So um, we currently have over 280 members and we're mostly from the UK, but we've got an expanding number of, um, of international members as well. Okay. Your, the three main goals are fantastic because they're clearly pointing to the fact that this is not just about our carbon footprint mitigation. This is a much more holistic approach that needs to take place within our industry, throughout all the genres, and actually globally as a society. Um, can I ask you a little bit about, from your organisation, some of the data that you've amassed and how much do we know about the specific footprint of natural history programming. Do we have enough data on that? Um, and what is some of the most sobering data in that regard, if we do have some? Um, I suppose through Albert that Tom's mentioned already, um, we have an idea, but because we're still lumped in with factual at the moment, it's quite hard to, you have to ask specifically um, for that natural history data to be extracted. So it takes time and an effort to do that. So, and we're hoping that that might change going forward. So we're in conversation with Albert about it. Um, but we know that travel and transport of people in kit are our biggest emitters still. Um, and Albert did give us some more recent figures from, I think it was October 21 to January 22. And it actually flipped, probably partly due to COVID, but freight at the moment is our biggest emitter at something like 58%, then flights at 28%, and then um, energy use on location um, is the next biggest emitter for us. But obviously that, that's just UK uh, productions that use out, but it doesn't include things like Disney Plus and Nat Geo who use a different calculator. Okay. Can I, can I just, I have a little bit of <coughs> insider information. Um, we love a big insider blue chip, information. You no, know, a big blue chip. A big blue chip has between 30 and 40 times the carbon footprint of a normal hour of television. Now, mind you, a big blue chip has about 20 times the budget of your average hour of television, but it has amongst the highest carbon footprints per hour of programming of per any kind hour, of programming. that's the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And of TV it... rather than film, but yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're the top yeah. of TV. On a, on a par with the big budget drama feature films. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
That's, yeah. That is sobering indeed. What can I ask you, Doug? What is your take on Albert and, and how it's contributing to us at least getting some information? What are we lacking? How, how do you feel about it in, in, well, in your Al experience? Well, Albert, Albert's a step in the right direction. Lots of good ideas, lots of you know, good ideas. If everyone followed it, then we would pull the, the footprint down. But um, you know, sometimes, it's, sometimes it points out the obvious and sometimes it takes aim at things that are very difficult to, to reduce. And it is about changing the ways that we do things. You know, instead of flying around people a lot, let's use more crews in the countries in which they're based. Let's have kept bases, perhaps. You know, I mean, battery bases at least. Batteries are the high, heaviest single thing that we carry. Um, you know, there'd be a fortune for someone who set up a battery hire yeah. place in a country and said, look, I'll give you all, you know, I'll hire you all the batteries you need. Yeah. That, you could almost certainly make that cheaper than flying the damn things out all around the world. But so the these kind of things. But then the cameramen who hire the batteries to the productions would be grumpy. Why? <laughs> because there's all these structural reasons as well, like why inefficient things happen on the production and often down to who's involved in it and what they'd prefer to happen. And what's always been done. And what's always been done. And I feel like the big, the, the elephant in the room in wildlife film at the moment is that it's making huge amounts of money while its subject matter goes extinct, which is really peculiar. Like, there's a gold rush for films, but the majority of those films don't, don't either make... They kind of... I, I think because we give ourselves a pat on the back for making everybody fall in love with nature, we give ourselves a pass that maybe other sectors like sport or food TV wouldn't give in terms of our impact and, and our duty of care to talk about what's actually happening to the subject matter. And I think that's a legacy thing because everyone loves wildlife film, or it's at least just, they did. Yeah, it's really interesting and it's touching on so many aspects. We just don't have enough time. We could be here for three hours because that's a very interesting point and, and it, pl it pl plays to sort of that question of we are trying to win over hearts and minds to the, get them to fall in love with nature again, to understand the importance of the planet, Wendy. But at what point is it, ju you know, is it justifiable to make a big landmark? And, and when do we decide what's justifiable and what isn't based on what Tom just said? You know, the, we're, we're making all these programs that are, have some of the biggest impact in all of television, but to what end? if our carbon footprint is so high, and if the story within the narrative isn't quite, isn't quite telling the whole story or isn't actually leading to tangible change so that those animals don't go extinct. Big question. I always give you the big questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're certainly not shying away from it either. Nice um, one, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, because we're all living it. You know, I did my PhD in Australia in 1988 on coral reefs, and I was seeing corals being bleached and the people I'm working with were doing, um, we were looking at coral cores which were proxies for climate change. So like all of us, I spent three years filming in India and do you point the camera that way <laughs> or do you point the camera and tell the true story? We've all been there. So uh, I don't think any of us are without a pretty hefty conscience and we wrestle with this every single day. Um, I think the, the, the initiatives that I have done within my capacity, and I think, like you said, Tom, we can only ever do collectively what is within our gift, all things considered. But I would say, in response to that, some of the things that I feel we're definitely driving forward, I mean, the big landmarks, we'll show a clip in a minute, Predators, the big Sky Netflix, first ever, Premium Nature, that's a good example of delivering that in less than half the time. So typically four years, that is a huge amount of mobilization. Uh, the audience will decide, but getting those production frameworks down to less than two years. And the real, one of the massive successes for this, and charts with Steve Batchel and Wales, is the number of in-country camera ops we're now working with um, who are delivering the world's best content. So moving beyond the kind of um, established kind of black book of who to go with, definitely that there was very few positives with the pandemic, but that was absolutely one that has become best practice and definitely a true to nature. That's something we've embraced on every level. It's good for the environment. Um, it's brilliant for the content. I mean, you'll see in Predators working with in-country camera ops on the Puma episodes. These are world-class camera ops and trackers and conservationists that have been studying these Pumas for 20 years. There is no one better nothing was shipped back and forwards when we were working with these guys. So definitely working with in-country camera ops is a massive step forward for all of us. 
every single aspect of what we're doing. We've all talked about batteries and stuff. Working with in-country um, companies a lot now using solar and different forms of charging batteries. So literally scrutinizing every single aspect of production from the get-go. And like you said, do we really need all that kit? Can we have half the kit? So I think you're right, gone are the, way to, gone are the days of just kind of same old, same old. We have to be very self-aware, both on screen and off screen. And to your point, Doug, um, what I feel in the 250 shows that I've made at True to Nature, um, as a scientist myself as well, I'm wanting to get those messages out, mm. but mindful of the platform and the audience, but even with predators, the conservation message is there from the get-go because apex predators around the world, we've all said it, are is in trouble as, as, as any animals at the top of the food chain. And we aren't doing them justice if we're not telling the story through their first-person perspective as to what they're dealing with day and day. And what's fascinating when you take that narrative approach, the big topics being climate, um, habitat loss, eviction, hunger, all the things that are happening to apex predators and other animals mirror our own world because we are inextricably linked. And what's happening to the natural world is mirroring in our own world. And so I think smart program makers are realizing that if you want to be at the cutting edge of innovation in storytelling, and with a particularly a younger audience being very discerning, very smart, um, then I think the way forward is to embrace the real world, literally, and use your craft skills to get those stories out there, being mindful of the companies that you're working with. But I, what I'm sensing, even broadcasters now, I think there's a real shift in appetite now, but with an approach and recognition of how to tell those stories in responsible ways, but nonetheless getting the messages out there, but still delivering innovation in terms of capture, uh, lots of innovation techniques now which are better for the environment. And also what we come on to is um, kind of just scrutinising all the suppliers we're using. I mean, at True to Nature, Sister Magic, local company, um, their credentials for sustainability are, I mean, they're planting orchards. I mean, you know, so now anyone we're working with, we're, we are saying this is our sustainability um, credentials. What do yours look like? So the... I use the expression the food chain, <laughs> um, but challenging all the people we're working with as well to saying, look, we're trying to do our bit from the company level. Every individual has a has their own personal plan around what they're doing to make a difference and just, you know, making it business as usual, making it a conversation, not a kind of inconvenience mm. or a difficult thing, but just going, hey, why wouldn't you? And what's more, why it's if it's good for the planet, it's good for nature and it's ultimately good for you, turning the language, and we were talking about that earlier, into a win-win, I think, is, is definitely something that we all share. We're just looking to kind of share our passion, our enthusiasm, what we're learning with others as much as we humanly can, and collectively make a positive difference on screen and, and off screen. Off screen. Yeah. It's all for the taking. There's plenty of scope there that you've, you really, you've touched on beautifully. There are a few obstacles I want to kind of bring up later on, the budgets and the costs and all of that across the board of the in industry. But you touched on, and I know you want to say something about that as well. Do you want, do you want to talk about costs and budgets now? Or? Oh, right. I can well, do you know what? Let's, let's park it for a second. I was just having one other thought. Oh, sorry, go on. That's all right. Do tell <laughs> I'm me a terrible shut chair. <laughs> no, but in the spirit of what we were just saying about which comes to costs and budgets, I think as well as aspiring to all of us produce the best content for the time, the money that we've got. Um, programming with purpose. I mean, obviously that's right at the heart of everything, all of you do, for sure. But that I think is becoming even more um, um, as a responsible filmmaker. So for example- More of a priority. In, yeah, just something you want to do. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, premium programming with purpose. So for example, of the expeditions we've been doing with Steve Batchel, uh, one of them was to Kyrgyzstan, um, doing putting the spotlight on um, snow leopards, obviously highly endangered, north pop, northern population and the southern population with this corridor between them, and the government were poised to press the button on a gold mine. But of course, if they built the gold mine, then that's going to really Came impact over. them. So we worked with the local um, snow leopard authorities, 
took our technology with our camera rigs and all the rest, showed unequivocal evidence of snow leopards using this corridor. I was up at COP26 talking to the Deputy Minister of the Environment for Kyrgyzstan, saying it's thanks to films like this we can use it to bring about policy change, hopefully to make good decisions that are good for Kyrgyzstan, good for the voters, um, even though there is obviously a commercial imperative that's got to be balanced. Mm -hmm. And we've done the same in Ghana with chimps. So I'm looking, um, and we took uh, sharks with Steve Batchel to COP26, to looking for programmes for find innovative ways to make content that can be used by policymakers, influencers, to make positive change and outcome, because that's all way beyond our capability but we do have the capability of making stories with purpose that can potentially... We do, and, and historically we haven't shied away from showcasing the research of scientists and, and very often in my voiceover saying this is the kind of data, this is the kind of evidence that can lead to policy change. It's about making sure that um, the general public, though, for personally, I think, are aware of why maybe that policy change hasn't happened. I'm not talking about your cases because you're very mindful about what you're doing and why and where it can have effects. But a lot of the times we make natural history programming with that kind of messaging and it just gets nowhere. And that's kind of the gap that I wonder, you know, how do we fill that gap in the storytelling that we do? How do we fill it more, basically, in order to really create the changes? Where... I want to get into kind of the nitty gritty of a couple of things before we get into the the, the really meaty stuff, really. But when you touched on um, talent, local talent, the training ground in Bristol in the UK is sort of world renowned, isn't it? And the, the main pool of talent still sort of remains in Europe and America. However, we've all filmed with incredibly talented filmmakers and crews locally. But we need to up that. If we're going to be real about how the natural history genre and the whole industry really tackles travel which is you know one of the biggest impacts Doug how do you think we can increase the talent pool locally is that part of the remit part of the investment you know to train local crews that will be working for you for your channel for your company how do we how do we go about that in your view well I think it would be it would be interesting if we if the company is based in UK or let's say the, the commission, not the commissioners, but the commissioners, yes, but also the production company who are making the film, if they were to send out, you know, a director or someone from production who was, you know, experienced and who had a feel for what kind of programme the, the company wanted to make, then that would help everyone on the crew out there to bring them up to speed, so to speak, faster. It's remarkable how I don't think there's very much difference between an average camera person and a really good camera person. It's really all about just saying to them, your close-up's a little bit bigger, you know, and give your... Remember, you're shooting for the editor, not yourself, this kind of thing. Mm. So if we could take them with that local experience or UK experience and just temporarily put it out there, I think that would bring people up. When it comes to presenters, there's something magic about the few presenters that really break through, you know, and, and it's almost like trying to pick a star actor, you know, yeah, there's something about them and <clears throat> you'll only find them by going out and, and looking um, or looking at show show reels and things and giving people a chance and, and being prepared to, you know, maybe some won't work, but when you find one that does, then again, they may not work across the world and it may be that you want to choose one who's more appropriate for the country in which you're working. But presenting so really isn't rocket science. And for, for it, me, it's like, it's about just repetition. So it's well, about it giving depends. those opportunities. Once there's a, I mean, you, 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 some semblance of talent, not just anybody. No, but, no, and no. then it's just repetition, it's practice, and they can get up to speed. Uh, well, there's some different ways of presenting, aren't there? Well, there's, yeah, there's, there there's, are. But... There's reading what's been given oh, to no. you. I mean, you know, good... But then the sort of spontaneous stuff. Good presenters. And, and acting, but good, that's, that's yeah, practice, they, they, right? They well, with, with practice, you get better. Yeah. And it helps if you can be understood across the globe, which... <laughs> If you're what are you Scottish, saying, Doug? You've got your back to the wall of that one. Yeah. Really think. quickly, what do you think about the footage? I mean, you have amassed some extraordinary footage um, over the years uh -huh. for many different channels and outlets. Um, do you think we're we're just too wasteful and we're too greedy with that footage? Well, it, w <clears throat> it would be wonderful if there was some way, and um, filmmakers for future 
I've got ideas about somehow sharing all the archive. I just think that has huge commercial issues with it because that archive that is produced for a programme is a gold mine for the companies who own it. To, so to say to them, open it up for anyone is a big, huge ask. But I do think there could be perhaps more. If we were to expand the kind of films that were being made, then that would you know, open up more use of the archive to make yeah. a different kind of film yeah. and uh, would save a lot of, you know, would save a lot of reshooting possibly. Christina, so, we're talking about some of the practicality, some of the things we can do, the talent, the batteries, the footage. But from your experience with your organisation, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to really achieving proper sustainable practices going forward? Um, there's, I mean, there's quite a few, but I would say, um, well, if we're talking about those kind of things, uh, one of the things we focus on is encouraging more collaboration. So, you know, we, at the moment, it, there are lots of things that are quite hard for an individual company to do, but if we got everyone together, you have more opportunities. So, for example, setting up kit hubs. There are, there is a um, company called Visual Impact who are trying to mm. develop a kit hub in Tanzania. There's other production companies that are working on their own kit hubs. So it is happening. And the more, you know, we, basically we run a, a forum, a sustainability and impact forum for wildlife production companies. And um, we try to run them every three months when we have capacity to do it. And we basically try and act as a, a conduit almost. So hearing about visual impact and what they're doing, we can introduce them to the companies and then if the companies are able to support that initiative, it, it snowballs from there. And they can hear about what each other is doing. Um, so collaboration is, is one key thing. And I guess challenges generally time, I would say, mm. in, in that we all have such limited time in making our programmes. And teams are working flat out generally. And it's really hard for them to have that extra time to explore alternative ways of doing things so it's it's trying to create a bit of space and support for those teams to find those other ways of doing things trying things out and being it's being okay to for something not to work and then to try something else you know yeah. it needs a bit more breathing can I sorry can I ask you a question Tom and to some extent Wendy knows I'm sure people are interested again when people when what is a what is a valid offset well, the most valid offset is not emitting the carbon in the first place. It's, yeah, yeah, but if you did, because someone very, very accurately, I think, described carbon offsetting as being a bit like Catholic indulgences, where you made your sin, you went to the priest, gave him some money, and he said, you're okay, boys, on you go. Yeah. And, you know, that yeah. offsetting does not pull the carbon out of the air. Right. So, so, far so what yeah. do you... Yeah, my friend of mine called Beth, she made a film taking the piss out of offsets a while ago where she, it was called Cheat Neutral, where <laughs> if you remained faithful in your relationship, so uh, you would pay someone else to remain faithful so you could cheat in your relationship <laughs> to try and point out the absurdity of it. Because like, ultimately, the amount of cheating would, would kind of, you'd be like, well, it's mutual cheating, but maybe you shouldn't cheat in your relationship. Anyway. And also, we're not there so, with offsetting. I mean, well, we're it's not really there complicated. with the actual, well, the actual different... practicalities of yeah. offsetting. We're not there, even carbon capture. So all of those things, yeah. when I looked into it for COP26, I was horrified at the, our net zero targets, you know, the, the world over, and exactly how are we going to achieve them? We're not anywhere near being able to actually do that in a practical way, are we? It's a, I mean, there's a scale of different technologies that are being used. Some are total greenwash. Uh, mm -hmm. Some would work if people did them, but there's no accounting systems or ways of measuring them. Other people are taking them very seriously. Uh, the EU sponsoring a thing with, I think, biochar, which is, I think, a lot better than planting a Sitka spruce yeah. plantation that then gets chopped down in five years and emits as much. It's just a big mixed bag. But also mm -hmm. the mixed like, bag doesn't have anything at, at scale yeah. to, to handle all the offsetting, all the different I industries. Just, I just think it's really, like, it's just such a downer as well. It's like the best you can do is not do anything, just pay someone else to clear up your mess. That's just not true. I think the biggest problem is the culture. The culture is like, the, for ages, like you've got on stage the people who care about it in the industry, and we'll probably like beat ourselves up about this way more than lots of our peers and definitely lots of the commissioners. 
and or at least until recently. But it's so hard to make these shifts when you're going against the priorities of your culture in anything. Whereas, you know, we all know it's important to take care of children on set. But at one stage, about 50 or 60 years ago, the people who were like, hang on, should there be somebody with this minor? They were the weirdos and they were taking more time and more money. Or if somebody wanted to climb a ladder to get a shot from a roof and someone was like, have they got the safety at height training? You were the dickhead who was like stopping the production from proceeding on schedule. This is what taking care of the planet feels like in our industry. You're kind of, until recently, you've been an outlier and it takes time and it's hard. And you also have that social thing of just being in the way of getting the job done. And it feels like it's so nice to be on this panel because lots of other people care about this now. But the main thing is getting the whole culture to change. And one part of that is making it the decision makers feel scrutinized. So the people who ultimately give us the budgets and give us the opportunities feel that though, though, though if they don't give us those opportunities that the audiences might be a bit peeved. And that's about linking audiences to distributors and broadcasters. The other is about regulation, so that it is seen, taking care of the planet, as a priority for everything. Exactly. And I think the other is camaraderie. And like, because in, our industry is so competitive. Like you, you, you fight for commissions, you fight for awards, you fight for exclusive access to shoots, and that's the antithesis of trying to solve problems together. When like, yeah, like Doug says, we've got all these mountains of beautiful footage. The big problem is we, we don't want to share them in case someone else makes money. But imagine if like, you made like a thousand carrots as a farmer and there were all these hungry people and you were like, I've made you a great meal, Netflix. No one else can have any carrots in case someone makes money. It would be ridiculous and everyone would be up in arms about all the wastage of carrots. But we don't have this scrutiny in the way that agriculture has this scrutiny because we're like a feel-good product with an ephemeral seeming like, um, like sort of industrial process. But it's not, they're, they're on hard drives. They exist, these things have taken resources to create. And I feel like, I feel like what it needs is like us to kind of unionize because so many producers, like people are stopping working on programs now because they're grossed out because it's called like Ultimate Beautiful Planet Six, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, you can just take six flights and you'll get paid. And it used to be, you'd feel so lucky just to get to go and make those films. But now you feel it's so against your, your inner self that you, you kind of like, chop yourself down and stop yourself taking part in it because it feels like so dissonant and so many of us feel like this. At least that's beginning to shift. Change happens slowly. We're a weird species. We're amazing in so many ways, but sometimes it just takes one person, mm. one organization to stick their head above the parapet and do something different. Then we all go, oh, oh okay then, do you know? And you're, you tend to, what's the phase for? Well, I've been trying that, but it hasn't shifted. Well, I'm, like. I'm smoothly <laughs> leading to a link to your film to say you, much, are, you are one of those people. And, you know, it, you have to chip away, but you certainly are one of those leaders in this field. And let's take a little look at an example of one of your Can I say something more films? enthusiastic first? It's been a great process. I'm uh, very <laughs> glad to be here. I want to ask you about the process after. Take a look at this. <laughs>
me is what happens when you get it right, both off screen and on screen, the messaging of that, the connection that we've, you felt with the ocean, but with human beings. Absolutely glorious. Talk me through how it came about. Well, that's only part of it, by the way. It, it goes on for like another three, three yeah, minutes. Yeah, and I so. urge you to, to watch the whole thing. It's four minutes in total or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's extraordinary. Watch it after this. It's amazing. But t tell me how it came about. Well, it was just really an experiment. So it, we, um, uh, Surface Against Sewage wanted to make a film. Uh, you had the G7 coming down to Cornwall, and they wanted to make something that represented UK seas and that brought in... Um, the kinds of issues, you saw that with the big block texts about the benefits of oceans for people, but that connected people to the sea. And they're a really interesting organization because they have loads of local community members and lots of people really engaged. So we thought it'd be, rather than like m us shooting a film, we thought, how could we totally, because I'd, I'd experimented making a film with Greta Thunberg where we're like, we try and recycle most of the materials. And this, like, if we could we recycle an entire film or upcycle an entire film, if, like, if we didn't shoot a single thing, if all the words already existed, if all the music and all the pictures already existed. So we used Surface Against Sewage's network and we asked filmmakers around the UK, amateur and professional, can you donate your footage to this? And a really important thing is, I think where, where Doug mentioned the commercial problems of sharing footage that already exists, I think a lot of filmmakers and commercial entities wouldn't have a problem if they knew that NGOs or educational use was granted. And, and we just got given like terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of beautiful footage to play with from surf filmmakers, from people who shoot adverts, from amateurs who love shooting um, orcas with drones in Shetland. We were blown away by how much footage we got and we tried to cut it together in a few days and it was kind of, it was lovely because it also, as a, as a filmmaking process, when you have like real restrictions on what you can use, sometimes that can lead to really interesting creative outcomes. When you don't have restrictions, you can get a bit lost and have loads of meetings about what you might do, and then you end up doing the thing you did last time because you've run out of time. Whereas if you've got a few things you can do, you kind of make something that you just really intimately respond to. And I think out of the films I've made, and I've made like, you know, stuff broadcast, you know, virals, whatever, like, it's the one that's made most people cry, and I was really surprised by that because I didn't shoot anything I didn't interview anyone, I didn't shoot anything, and as I love going out and filming, so I had a bit of an identity crisis also, because how am I gonna still get to go film stuff too? Because I really wanna do that. <laughs> um, but it was really fascinating. Um, and like with some of the higher production value stuff we've done, just to try and prove there is a fetish for new stuff in wildlife film, like if it's not newly shot, if it's not 8K, even though most people don't have a telly that can show that, you kind of feel like, oh, let's get, let, you know, all new material. But there's, there's, when I worked at the BBC, I went into the archives and, and I found like shoots for Planet Earth One, not shots, whole shoots that hadn't gone into the film. And I, and I used them in films I made and it's so fun, but it's, and so beautiful. And you can, you can revel in this footage. And I've been speaking to Indian filmmakers today about they're trying to do the same thing, uh, trying to connect up all the independent filmmakers, the amateur filmmakers. Cause you know, if you've got a drone, you can't really tell the difference. I can't even tell between pro and amateur drone photography anymore. It's about where you are, mostly, apart from how the move works. But how do we share this? Yeah. Sorry, I keep, I'm banging on. But You're like, not. This, it's, it's fascinating. And it, it, how, do you mo how do you take that then and scale it up to a longer form documentary or a series? And it kind of takes me to Predators now. I know you've touched on it already, Wendy, but what were the challenges when it came to making a big landmark series with Sky and Netflix compared to something as sort of purely simple as that, that is really impactful? But of course you want to make how many episodes in Predators? It's five. So five one hours of programming with, you know, you've touched on the content, how you wanted it to be, the messaging was just as important to you, but how did that play out with two big juggernauts? One, Sky, that sort of has been leading the way in sustainability, and one sort of coming up the ranks, wanting to make all these landmarks, but not the biggest, kind of, the best reputation. How did, how did you find the whole experience? <laughs> um, I have to say, Rural, it's, it's been a very positive experience. Uh, I think the, the end result speaks for itself, um, because we've ended up with one film. Uh, for both, uh, and I think that that also says a lot around where two big brands ultimately, with interesting, uh, I use the word demographics, audiences that are are looking for the best drama. I mean, the case of Sky, best drama, best sports. You know, they're watching the big match, they're watching Game of Thrones, the best 
uh, comedy entertainment and, and, and news, and then for big premium nature shows to hold their own, you have to be sensitive to that audience, to that world. Otherwise, I mean, one of the biggest challenges for all of us, we can make amazing content, but it doesn't find an audience. So there is that quid pro quo. And, you know, your question about budgets, you know, yeah, they are big budgets, but the expectation is sky high <laughs> in terms point. of innovation never seen before, expectation to reach 500 million audience. So it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a check to go and do what you like. Um, that said, um, I think what has been, I think, for me, a real game changer working with, that was the very first co-production Sky Netflix had ever done, so it's an experiment on all levels, but to end up with one film, to have the environmental message from start to finish, significantly though, um, telling the story from first person narrative through the eyes of the cheetah, through the eyes of the polar bear, and, and a, the, the aspiration was to empathetically get into their world, see their world. So 80% of the scripting is very much from a first person without being anthropomorphic, so never crossing the line in terms of superimposing an, inf an uh, motion on an animal that simply scientifically you can't prove. Um, but that's... Although I like to challenge that myself. I think we, we've veered so much away from anthropomorphizing. Sometimes we kind of ignore some of the emotions are very similar to ours, aren't they? You know oh, that with, anyway. But without a yeah. doubt, it's just the not falling foul of in the commentary saying that animal is happy or sad, but definitely you can say it's just fed. Um, there's no predators, the sun's out, life is good. You can definitely it's happy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your prerogative to think that. My as a craft producer, I will elicit that. Because I'm looking at it, and as a yeah, behavioral no, biologist, just, I, I would say that looks pretty good. Um, because it's I think the music that does it. It's the yeah. music that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, you know but, what? That's but, a good point. But that's so. I would advocate that music is oh, everything. Massive. Yeah. Absolutely. In yeah. terms Absolutely. of yeah. using, we were with Nanita Desai, um, critically acclaimed, but also interestingly, everything we've talked about here is new innovative approaches and the traditional natural history is very much a full string orchestra we took synths and electronic oh, nice. sounds and looked to tell the story through the music so that tonally empathetic where is the story right here right now from whose perspective are we telling the story what's the emotional sensibility would shape the music um, I and i think that also then attributes to why you know the question you probably would ask is why on earth would you choose tom hardy if you have a character-led narrative, you need somebody who can read a script, become Alfie Solomon, whoever they're needing to be, because that's what he is one of the world's best at, to be able to add 80% his tone, 20% his words. So his ability, I would advocate, to, to bring emotional depth and sensibility to the plight of our apex predators in their world is why he was a choice to tell that story, bring in a new audience, and that's what a lot of us are about. Mm. How do we reach audiences that wouldn't necessarily watch For sure. traditional, very established natural history, um, bring a new tone, a new style, a new audience, new sensibility. Mm. And I also think what's really significant and I feel very proud of, all these films go out in the one hour slot, but they have um, an additional Predators Up Close film where we put the spotlight very specifically on, um, we talked about Individual, uh, individual teams or camera ops working on locations. So through their eyes, we hear their world story about their backyard, what they're doing, the conservation efforts, the sustainability efforts. And so it starts to, again, in a premium slot, spot, we can start to get important messages, stories about some of the world's best conservationists, scientists, uh, and local experts. Let's face it, without which without their work, their dedication, so much of what we film, we simply wouldn't be possible. Absolutely. And I feel, you know, if there are a lot of unsung heroes, our job as well, I think, through all these different mediums, short form, long form, quite frankly, any form, looking to take a much more holistic approach to getting stories out there that feel more balanced, more real, more human, and then ultimately, I feel, will have more relevance in our world. We, need, we need to see a clip. <laughs> we need to see a clip, don't we? Well, I should just say we've also, this is just the opening uh, 90 seconds that will premiere on Sunday night, 11 o'clock. All five will drop, but then it'll be 
every week for, for five weeks. But an uh, initiative that we took at True to Nature, because obviously every film, the 240 films we've made, all Albert accredited, and we push to get three stars. If we only get two, we try and push ourselves to get three, which does come down to electric cars, uh, you know, all the things every, that we've talked about. Everywhere you can look, yeah, And the production minimize. teams are second to none. And I think it's fair to say, and I don't mean this, you know, I'm in the older generation, so I can say it, but the up-and-coming filmmakers are proactively also challenging us and want to be part of a culture and a community that not just says it, does it. And I invite all of them constantly to make us better filmmakers. And so I think it is that collective knowledge exchange. But one of the things we took the initiative to as part of our Albert accreditation is we've made a film, didn't have to for the commissioners, which I hope, well, Scar already said they're going to put it out there on their YouTube channel. Albert will hopefully put it out there, which is sharing some of the production techniques with the people on location in Africa using solar up in the Arctic. And so, like you say, just using those premium platforms, not to be underestimated, but don't just occupy the kind of shop window. Let's challenge ourselves with all that footage. We've also got a lot of <coughs> uni students in there digitising it as part of a kind of... Um, because that's the challenge. All the footage comes back. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And then yeah. the, the yeah. nightmare... Yeah. But We've built a partnership with, with the University of West of England, so they're getting a... Uni students, undergraduates, are getting opportunity to be in a production environment, and it's great for them to be trawling through footage with one eye on thinking, how do best do we then um, turn that amazing content into new forms mm. of content? And I think that is the way to get those broadcasters on board, because ultimately, you're right, it's theirs, but they don't... They also want to be part of the future. Mm. They're just not going to think about it it is for us to say, here's a great idea, will you back it, will you support it? And then, um, like we did with Poppy, we sent that film to her and she went, it's amazing, bringing the impact team, they all went, this is fantastic. You know, one little initiative, but if we can snowball that, mm -hmm. that becomes the cultural norm. Yeah, And, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. everybody wants it. Breaking boundaries but it does, and making you know, new things the norm, the absolutely. The speed at which we all want to move at, I think, is our challenge. We want to go 100 miles an hour, but like we've all said, <laughs> it feels quite That's interesting. slow to, to make that um, move. But shall yeah. we take but a you look? Know, that's what I remember, um, what's his name? The, um, who's the Justin Roller? He did a series on the BBC, quarter of an hour, you know, five a day. And he looked at tipping points. And he looked at tipping points in the Arctic, tipping points in the ocean. And he got through four of them. And I thought, there's no good news in this at all. But he kept the most important one to last. The most important one is tipping point of public opinion. Mm. When that goes, <laughs> whoosh, it'll suddenly go. So it's how just do we a matter of to that? how well exactly will that come what quick enough. What kind of stories, Doug, do we need to tell to create that tipping point? Because all of us feel the pressure because of what we know, what we see, the reality of what's happening. How can we continue to challenge ourselves with the stories we tell? Well, how I, radical I do think, we get? Well, I think we have to get very radical. I, I think the big changes are only going to get made by politics and economics. Politics and big businesses are the only things capable of making change at the scale that we need to make them. So it comes back to, you know, all the, all the wildlife films, there's often this wistfulness that <laughs> comes through. We need anger. We need anger out there. We need anger and people, you know, in, in more than just wistfulness, but people in tears, people dying, you know, because of climate change. And, and I think if you begin to show that, you know, I think we need that level of emotion to be brought so into it. And it could be, you know... You know, you could have that with your conservation people, etc. One thing I watched, the Frozen Planet, episode six, <clears throat> and it was very touching, but there was one scientist there, Bill Fraser, whom I know, who's worked in the Antarctic for 40 years, and he genuinely, talking about the fate of the dailies down the peninsula, the daily penguins, he genuinely started crying. And well done, the cameraman, for, or camera person, for keeping rolling on him while, while he did that. And for the editors and the commissioners you know, to choose to keep it in. Well, holding that in. <laughs> You know, because the best stories are, when you look at documentaries, often the best story is circulates, you know, as if it's center, one charismatic character. And it's up to us to find those charismatic characters across the world in the conservation bodies and things and get them in front of the camera. I mean, that I, will help. I mean, I think there's another thing, which is just that 
a lot of people, when I first got into, I started in docks in London and went down to Bristol to work in natural history and I went on a shoot and they were like, you're going to take sound recording equipment, why are you bothering to do that? We can just add it later. And like, as a docks person, I was like, but how do you tell the story of what happens if you add the sound later? And it was because it was about the shots, not what happened. And I feel in wildlife film, we need to allow ourselves to be documentary makers again, where we film what takes place in front of us and we're given the opportunities by our commissioners to go on location and respond to the story as it happens, to be, to, rather than being like planning the shoot in advance and then just going and getting our shot list. Because then the stories will be more interesting and real. Whereas at the moment, we're limited by our imaginations. And if it's the same people's imaginations every time, they end up shooting the same thing each time. And if something doesn't go to plan, it doesn't generally go in because you've pitched something else. How and much can we challenge ourselves with this? I think How we much need... Can, I mean, we were talking about it before this chat, right? And I'm, I'm excited about this particular question. About what well, I'm going to show this clip. If it's the last thing I do, Wendy, I'm showing the clip of Predators. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we up-level how we tell stories. We know, you mentioned economics, politics, systemic, the need for systemic change, which I want to ask you about, Christina, with respect to what you're doing with your organisation. But I feel a responsibility to intertwine and interconnect all of those elements of how the planet is being damaged in the same way as we understand that everything is interconnected. And we tell those stories beautifully when it comes to the food web, but we don't add in humans oft, mm -hmm. often enough. And then if economics and politics you know, and a systemic failure is what we know to be true, the, the, the absolute stumbling, but the brick wall that stops all these conservationists that you showcase and their animals from actually achieving what they want to achieve. Does natural history programming slash science programming slash environmental programming all just have to evolve and interconnect itself so that we tell viewers the full interconnected story of what's happening to our planet? You've got something to say about this, Steve. Christina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's one of the things we talk about in FFW a lot. Some of my colleagues are here um, with us. But the idea that we, we can help shift culture with our content. If we help, you know, one of the things is to help um, audiences and ourselves, you know, remind ourselves that we're part of nature. We're not separate from it. And we are nature. Yeah. And that we can have a huge influence even just doing that with our content. And, and, um, and I've forgotten what else I was going to say now. <laughs> About sort of telling this whole story of systemic issues, economics, yeah. politics. And, and the, the need for... Um, we're so used to kind of focusing on... Go we go, our go-to is the wildlife experts, the behavioural experts. But actually, if we do want our content to have an impact and, cha and change, make a change... Should we be evolving and talking to social scientists, humanities, you know, other parts of society that can help us understand the psychology of the audiences that we need to reach? And then tell stories in order to enable com more conversations. I I'm really keen to tell more stories of those who had to lean into eco-anxiety and got through the other side, those who decided to work with donut econ econ economists instead of, you know as part of a natural history series, because to protect the planet, we need to understand all those aspects of our system. Can I ask you, we're running out of time, Predators is coming up in a second. <laughs> the very system that we're talking about that you brought up you know, very aptly, Doug, um, is, is it in disabling us with respect to how quickly we can move. You talked about how we want to move quick, more quickly. It's part of the problem that this very industry that is hoping to change hearts and minds and to educate, to inform and to entertain, it's tied to a system that prioritizes profit and you know, budgets and growth, and as all industries are. Is that our biggest obstacle? How do we help to tell the stories about the problem with the system, but also try to, as the business community, work together to not prioritise profit and growth and buying out all the small indies into this big old... Um, you know, how do yeah, we, we have those discussions? Is, it, it just needs bravery. Who's I mean, going to be brave? It just needs Wendy, bravery. Netflix, brave. Netflix have got brave. more money than you could throw a stick at. So they just need to decide that they're going to make a series like that. They're going to bring together the people, the talent, who could make that. And it doesn't matter if it makes a profit. Yeah. Does it? I think it needs to treat itself like an art form, not a profit stream. Yeah, exactly. Like, 
I think, like, what's the long view if you're filming coral reefs now? Like, to own the only archive of something that doesn't exist? Like, it's really weird. I think so many people in wildlife TV don't watch wildlife TV because there's no surprises in wildlife TV. Like, when I got into it, you tell your friends and family when you made a film, please watch this. Loads of my colleagues don't suggest I watch the films they make because I don't think they're very interesting. And I think that's because we're a, why are we a genre? You were having this conversation, or should we let politics in? Of course we should. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Do you think any yeah. other genre of documentary is like, should we mention anything apart from this tiny thing? Yeah. Like the problems and the stories and what you're saying, you want to hear the stories about people with eco-anxiety, the things that made people cry in that film, what other people's relationship to nature and the things they struggle with, not an endless stream of beauty. we don't have to excuse ourselves. It doesn't have to be, yeah. I'm, I agree with you, I'm, I'm as angry as hell, so put me on there to rant with the best of them. But it doesn't always have to be angry or negative. No, no, it's no, about no. somebody who had eco-anxiety and what did they do to deal with it? Lent into it, moved on, all of those beautiful things that we as communicators are all experiencing. And you know, Those are the stories I want to help tell. Is, should we be an art form or should we be even more than that? Is it time to be sort of this community-led, all-embracing hug of a thing? That when you watch a series, you just feel part of something and you're inspired and you have resources at your disposal. You know where to volunteer, you know, a bigger thing at a time where, you know, our very existence is threatened. The planet will go on. We all know that. I'm excited about the prospect of us being this, this beautiful, cohesive society or community that inspires and, and creates change together as we all kind of come together more and more. That's what that's my vision for a natural history program, and to really um, get the changes well, we maybe, need. Well, maybe we need to ditch the idea of natural history filming, yeah. you know, yeah. just bring it, you know, just like, you Planetary, know, planetary, environmental, just think whatever, of, just yeah, to, whatever, you know, whatever is relative to the big story. web of life genre. Like, well, that, well. That, that doesn't flow off the tongue. Well, you know, it, it, I mean, it's a big issue. Mm. If you want to make a series about climate change, that involves the natural world, economics, politics, you know, a whole lot of stuff. And and we could, well, I'm saying we, I don't know, I have the talent to bring that all together, but there are talented filmmakers out there who could make a series like that, make it creative, but then you have to push through the people who will say, oh, people won't get it. Somebody Believe me, has to I, have talked, it, yeah. I like have talked, said, yeah, yeah. I have talked to the public so many times and I can almost hardly need to vary what I say to a primary school versus you know, an amateur audience. We underestimate yeah. our audience yeah. as well. Yeah. We're yeah. completely running out of time. I am going to play Predators now and then I'm going to ask for a final word from each of you. But take a look at this, the new project from Sky Netflix and True to Nature, Predators. But what, I just want to say, the trailer, the strap line is getting closer to danger. It's not, da it's positioned not so much danger as in their apex predators, closer to danger in terms of the natural world in which they inhabit. So whether it's the forest fires, the ice melting, mm. and so the positioning is very much around these animals are in danger because of what we are doing Powerful to the planet. messaging. And so whilst it's not on the nose and getting mm. angry, no. It is totally <laughs> in it. I'm not proposing. <laughs> I'm yes, going to talk are, to and I back you up 100%. I'm going to persuade the, David the, to have a rant <laughs> in his next series. But the one thing I was just saying, on the backing up from that, because I know we've got to close off, is I've also, in my 30 years, I've made 1,000 children's natural history films or nature films. And one, two, three, with three um, up-and-coming brothers. Well, they're not up-and-coming. They're late 20s, early 30s. But I, I, I hold... One of the reasons I've devoted a huge chunk of my career is with those thousand nature shows is to inspire the next generation, the young adults coming through. And when I was up at COP26, I got inundated by people from university wherever saying they've watched <coughs> amazing conservationists and scientists centre stage and taken inspiration from the work that people are doing. And I think, again, you know, more please, but, but the thing is it's just collectively what we're all saying is everything we can humanly do to make a positive difference, to make the world a better place, Absolutely. is something I think mm -hmm. which drives each and every one of oh. us. But there's lots of different approaches. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they're all yep. valid, mm -hmm. really, is my view. Absolutely. We just, we just have to do what we can within our sphere. It's just some sphere. carbon heavier than others. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to um, open the floor to questions, if anybody had some questions. Did any of you want to have... I think we kind of shaped up what natural history is going to look like in the future pretty well. Um, but did any of you want to have a final few words about like your vision of what 
it's going to look like if we get things right. Anything else that you wanted to make sure you wanted to say to our audience this evening? Christina? I, I guess maybe um, one, of the, one of the things we're trying to encourage is uh, looking at the craft of impact production and how that could be brought into broadcast TV, into wildlife broadcast TV. Because at the moment, um, it's sort of more common in social docs and, and more common in the States. But there are opportunities for us to, <coughs> to bring in um, aspects of that. And it's, it's just, we'd love it to be normalised, to think about what's the added value you could bring with your content um, and whether, you know, are there organisations that you could partner with that are dealing with some of the issues that came up when you were filming? <coughs> and can they, can they um, say some of the things that if you're not able to say them in your content, can you work together and amplify each other's message? There's always something extra. There's lots of untapped opportunities, basically, we feel. There really um, are, and it all, it all starts with collaborations and mm. speaking to each other to expand yeah. what we think we might even be able to do. And that opens up a whole world of then opportunities. That, then it? that demands a contract that allows you to do that. Yeah. Demands a contract with the commissioner, demands a big magnanimous enough and, and risky enough, not you know, Somebody willing to take a to chance brave. to say, look, I'll give you money to make this series. If you come across some really big issues separately that you want to go into, fine, you spot my budget for that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Put my it name on the bottom of it, maybe. But, courage, you know. bravery, 21st century leadership is what I call it. No, Somebody right, who's yeah. willing to just... Yeah. You say it in that film that we showed at the beginning of the, of the session, uh, your organisation does, about no matter how long it takes, how much money, it's not about that, how much money it costs, that's what we need to start prioritising. Mm. And that's when it opens up the whole yeah. issue of systemic change. So there's a, there's a, there are big challenges. Mm -hmm. There's lots of incredibly inspirational um, action taking place. But it requires courage, collaboration. It needs and imaginative leadership. To, imaginative yeah. leadership. And that leadership ultimately comes from the people who are right. asking you to make the programme. So we're officially calling for that tonight, aren't we? But there are, there are production companies already, that, and that's what's heartening for us, is we hear <laughs> through our forum, we hear what some of the companies are doing. And, and often we hear about um, conversations or requests with commissioners that most of us wouldn't even know we could ask. So it's almost like we, um, one of our colleagues said, assume it's a yes. <laughs> just, mm. just ask. Nice. Like, we don't uh, ask yeah, enough. That's true. Yeah, don't ask, so, don't get. Don't so there's a, there's a few great examples of this, but getting content seen where it's made can have such a positive impact. And it's actually really rare for that to happen, surprisingly rare. Um, so uh, one of our contacts, they did a deal with their commissioning channel to get that content seen in that local, um, on that local TV channel in Kenya. So, so local people, and they did a mobile cinema as well so to reach communities. Um, and that had such a positive impact on the human wildlife conflict situation. There's just lots of examples like that that we might not think to even ask to build that into the contracts. Mm -hmm. And what else could we be asking for? Well, that's why your organisation is incredibly important at this, at this time. Does anybody have any questions for our panel? Yes, I think we have a microphone here for you. I'll start with a brief comment and then a question. I should say, um, I'm actually sort of retired with portfolio career, interesting, partly involved with the industry, but also I chair the Transport to Users Group, and we actually be looking at um, looking at the cost of transport or what have you. And to make the comment, I think having people... Uh, overseas production is, is great in one sense, and I'm sort of training up people in Africa. That's absolutely wonderful. But there's always a danger people don't travel. I always think that by travelling, you actually see different countries. It really broad the horizons. I have to be very wary about trying to do everything uh, in this country. You might lose something out on the, on, on the diversity front. My question is, um, if you look at it, I mean... On the one hand, we can say, right, we'll stop producing CO2, we'll sort of go back to the Stone Ages, there'll be lots of social issues, I think that's really an answer. I think there are um, technical, technical solutions, but they have difficulties. Examples, uh, you can try hydroelectric power, well, I seem to remember David Bellerin was going on about the, the dangers to wildlife of that, build wind turbines, can kill birds, um, you know, um, grow a biomass, I mean, I, I, I go on and on. Uh, do you, how do you, would you go about actually say, well, there are these solutions, but there are also these issues? And kind of doing a discursive um, discussion or get people uh, people interested. Do you think there's a role for that, and how would you go about doing it? 
Well, I think, I think you know, I think a lot of these arguments that are, that are put up by, by so many people or discussions, um, some of them are often based on, on a lack of knowledge. And so the main purpose of, of the filmmaking that we should do should be, you know, to bring light to, to a debate um, to give people the facts, um, you know, both pros and cons, if there are pros and cons. Um, but it doesn't mean, because there are pros and cons, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're equal pros and cons, you know. So we should be willing to, to you know, to, to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, and, 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 you know, and that should drive what the eventual conclusion might be as to what's best to do. Perhaps our responsibility is to commun better communicate reports like the IPCC report, the planetary report that comes out of the World Wildlife Fund, which is a huge collaboration from all different scientific di disciplines, to, to be clearer about some of the doubts, some of the issues that people might have about some solutions. Because what is very clear from my experience of what I've read so far is that all the solutions are there and they are not at all pitted equally with respect to some kind of like the, the pros and cons to nature. We have the solutions to implement and create an absolutely sustainable future and to protect our wildlife. We just don't communicate it perhaps enough in the media, in the news, maybe on our programs, and then we need to have the will, the courage, and the, um, you know, the deprioritizing of, of, of growth and GDP above all else, and then we, we can solve this. That much is clear. Uh, can I just, uh, in response to your first question about, I think you said uh, about you know, it's important for people to travel, and so if we work with local crews, as in remote units, we don't get the opportunity to like expose ourselves to new cultures. That I think I wouldn't consider this an all-or-nothing question. You know, if you've got a team of like ten people, you don't need to go intercontinentally three times with ten people. You could just have four of you go on the first shoot, and two of you on the next, and one of you on the last. And you've massively reduced your footprint, but you've also built those connections with other people. I, I did a remote shoot for Greta with a, a, where she was in Sweden, and I shot it from the UK remotely. I was a bit sad. I wanted to go. And I was on Brighton Beach watching down a lens in a Stockholm apartment as somebody else directed her with me WhatsApping, saying, can you ask that? Can you ask this? What's on the left? Does it look nice that way? And I felt really restricted as a director, so I felt sad then. The film was fine. And then, but then the unexpected benefit of that was that it, it wasn't one way, and it, the relationship developed. That director enjoyed that interaction, who was remotely directing it. And then he asked me to shoot something in the UK for him. So I went off and shot something for him. And he didn't like having me shooting his film either. And I was off filming this economist in Cambridge my way. And then he saw the footage and he was like happy with it. But then the really fun bit is that neither of us quite knew what to make of this footage that he'd shot. So we ended up co-directing the film together. And it ended up being a totally different film from the one that he'd planned. And we both really got on like happy little fraggles together, like two brains that wouldn't have otherwise met. We had this really <laughs> fun collaborative partnership. And now his Swedish film company gives my English company work and was making another film together. And that film, the New York Times has acquired it and Alexander Skarsgård is narrating it. And it's weird and odd. And it's nothing that either of us would have made individually. So we made that like environmental, oh God, might as well decision that ended up making a really unusual film because we wouldn't have otherwise met and we wouldn't have had this international like collaborative relationship and I think we often talk about these sustainability decisions as just losses because we can't imagine because we haven't experienced them the accidental gains that might come out of them so that's exciting yeah right and that's that. really nice it's more interesting than if I just shot it it's also a moot, you know, Sorry, a moot no. point as to how much a camera crew going on to location learn about local culture. Yeah. You know, it's a very privileged position that you're in. You're often whisked from the airport to the hotel or straight to the camp and you don't see so much, you know, of... Well, the natural world that you might see is a very privileged view of the natural world. You know, so... Indeed. You see a lot of buffets <laughs> together. <laughs> <laughs> this lady here. Good evening. Um, is working. Yeah. Um, my name is Variety D. I'm a stand-up comedian, so I don't know why I'm here. No, yeah, I do know why I'm here. <laughs> um, my mum forced me in here uh, to part. Well, not participate, but to ask question on behalf of my little brothers and my, my cousin. All three of them are autistic, different spectrums, and they really do love um, nature and stuff a lot more than me. Um, <laughs> and 
Uh, my question is, is how do they break barriers? Because there's different ages. The one of them's age seven. That's the youngest cousin. Um, both my brothers, they are both autistic. One, well, they just one of them's turned fifteen. The other one's turned twenty-four. Um, and in the hearts of South London, not this, not this area, um, our area, there's still the, the glass ceiling. And I just want to ask you guys, how do they break it when they have people like in our neighbourhoods that don't believe in them, um, that be um, young, black and autistic to do their own documentaries and stuff and to get them ahead for like things like Netflix and BBC, you know, like, you know, so they have the Attenborough kind of levels. Those they levels. want to make programmes. Yeah. They want to get, They oh, want to push gosh. it forward, but what... What's the advice and what resources can can they have to achieve it? I think it's, it's really interesting. I'm I'm very acutely aware of the power of nature films to reach, um, yeah, all ages, but children in particular with, like you said, autism um, yeah. uh, and things like that. And and I've often and I think it's I'm not a medical expert in any shape or form, but what you've just described is not um, is something I'm very aware of and and it's and again um i think it's to do the fact that nature is non-judgmental you know everything in life is so judgmental there's an expectation and yet it just isn't and there's something you know the more we discover about the natural world the more we discover about ourselves and it's a place that people seek in solace often and it, it's just very life-affirming and it can be so joyous. I mean, it, it, it is a, it's, yeah. a, it's a place that you can feel very um, empowered and yeah. connected. The, the only young man that's pushing them forward is the, this young boy called An Anish, Anishwa, I think they yeah. are. And he's in Britain's Got Talent. And he was, what, six, seven years old? I, I know him. They're and all he should have won. But, um, yeah, he totally should have won. So, yeah, I mean, my friend won you, but well, still, I told him. Oh, him. Well, well, sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Please <laughs> do reach out to Vicky and the team. Um, and, and I'm very happy to connect. Um, on, on, on lots of levels. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I think Anishwa is amazing. <laughs> and what he's doing is just utterly brilliant. Yeah. And he's just done that film. And that's in the sky. I've been backing his kind of seven things, you know, in, in response to the COP27, which, you know, I know it can feel very like a lot of shop talk, but if there's one or two or three things that move the dial on, it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And he's... Uh, uh, one of the best voices for nature we could dream for. Yeah, yeah utterly. So but that's yeah. brilliant that you, if you can reach out yeah. to Vicky at the yeah. RTS. And Tom, on a more practical level, well, but that's fantastic. Well, I mean, like, two of the most famous nature communicators are neurodiverse. You know, you've got Chris Packham, who's famously uh, has Asperger's, and Greta Thunberg. And I can say, having worked in this field, there's a lot more neurodiverse people who choose to spend their time by themselves in a forest than in an <laughs> office environment. So it's quite welcoming. And I think already there are a lot of people who have different ways of sensing and perceiving the world and interacting with other humans. And the big problem with wildlife film, and I, I think one big problem is it is so few perspectives are brought to telling the stories. It's often the same people from the same backgrounds. That's why the stories are very samey. And I think that's why we're often saying, like, what's the ideal film that we should just the same guys make now to fix this problem? It's actually just, it should be lots of different people coming in. And I think all of us on this panel are working to try and bring people in. And I think all of us would be happy to have anybody contact us yeah. and ask for help yeah. doing that. Because yeah. just fast. Just I just want to have other people's perspectives on nature. That's what I'm interested in. Like. And just to say, to let your brothers, is it your brothers? Yeah. yeah. If they like dinosaurs. <laughs> so we've got a new series, Dino Club, coming out on the 13th of February, 20 episodes. But the talent, um, Aya and Harriet, are both from a black, diverse background really? and they are center stage and they're 10 years old and they are fantastic so that's another and that's backed by sky kids so again another See how probably a small step in the right direction but to the very point that you've just made um i hope yeah i think we've well. got good role models coming through and the fact is that getting your material out there where it can be seen yeah. has never been easier youtube's there you've got a phone you can make a film you may need to learn, you need to be prepared to learn a little bit of the discipline perhaps of a little bit of editing, what have you, but it's all there and you can get it out there and there's nothing to stop. You know, if it's noticed by the right people, then it whoosh, on you come. Well, he's testament to that. We are out, of, well, you need to go, it's five past eight, <laughs> but shall I uh, la let this lovely lady just ask her final question and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Go ahead. Thank you so much.
Uh, I went to the Mirrors and Movers conference a few months ago at the BBC, and they were talking about how they've just started working with Minecraft on a game from the eyes of a polar bear. And I didn't know whether there was anything... I know, Tom, you mentioned about... Matt, Matt or Tom, sorry? Tom, yeah, yeah, Tom. Tom, yeah. Um, just you, a, a generic man name. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned about how you have... There's lots of archives you found with the BBC, and I didn't know whether there was anything in the pipeline for any of you on working with gaming companies to translate, I guess, some of those archives into I, games. I think that was Frozen Planet 2, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was Frozen Planet with Microsoft, and they uh -huh. took Minecraft, and then they took different perspectives. This was Frozen Planet, which was very popular with eight-year-old wow. boys in the UK. <laughs> Brilliant. Any, any of you have experience of, or, or plans to explore that more? I'd love to. But I've got no idea how to. No. But yeah, but it's a it's a it's a lovely different avenue, isn't it, to reach a different audience, which is what we were talking about. Okay, really quickly though. <laughs> Just I guess following on from that, so I'm Benita Riley. Thank you. I'm Benita Riley, Futurativity, along with Claire, and we deliver sustainability across the industry. So first of all, just thank you to all of you for everything that you're bringing tonight, because I think it's really important. And I guess my big question to all of you is what you're doing in natural history in this genre is really incredible by pushing boundaries. But we see in the insights that we get from the work that we do is how do we do this across genres? You know, how do we translate the work that's happening here to the rest of the industry? Because that's what we're hearing across the board from channels through to this creativity yeah. challenge about how we apply these ideas and creative ideas into sustainability to take the mainstream, because that's what we need to do, don't yeah. we? So I think the heart of everything we've talked about as well is innovation. And one of those is building... Um, more, I use the expression, biological term, hybrid teams. So, for example, I used a drama writer on um, some of the Predators, um, worked with some VFX guys um, as well. So definitely built a team with mixed genre expertise because I didn't want to deliver traditional, classic blue chip natural history because there's lots of it out there, it's brilliant but for all the conversation we said this today. So I think by having the confidence to build new teams with a good mixed balance of specialist biology, specialist skills in natural history, combining with some best people of drama, I think gaming is really interesting. Um, definitely, I, I definitely approached it as a lot of the audience are, are, are gaming, putting it down, and so it's a ringside seat on a wild arena, first person, they're not avatars, they're real animals in real places doing the most extraordinary things. To your point, Tom, we didn't write the script, they wrote the script, we told their story and we didn't shy away from it. But I think that's the thing I would say, again, it's taking the, uh, you know, having the initiative and the belief and the confidence to then build teams for all the right reasons, because it works to mutual benefit. Um, and then, you know, hopefully some of the things we're doing at True to Nature people will then take back into their drama arena or fact end arena, wherever they've come from, and we'll learn things from them as well. So definitely inspire a, cu uh, a culture of learning um, and learn, fail fast, learn quick. And Christina, <laughs> when it comes to your organization as well, Filmmakers for Future Wildlife, am I right in thinking it's, there's Filmmakers for Future? There's, there's quite a few different groups, actually. Um, but I'm just wondering whether, because Albert obviously deals with all the other genres and doesn't specify for wildlife at the moment, which is kind of why we formed our own group. Although lots is relevant, you know, for, for everyone. Mm. So there's lots of resources and, and I think there's a... I don't know how much is um, in the, out in the public domain yet, but I think there's opportunities to, to learn through Albert for any genre. So there's lots of... Yeah, exactly. Um, and I suppose we, I mean, we do focus on wildlife just because there is this existing hub in Bristol, but we are expanding to international members as well. Um, and there are things that are specific to wildlife, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be happy to share with other genres. And we'd learn, like you were saying, we'd learn from, from you as well. So um, there's opportunities for collaboration, cross collaboration for sure. It, it feels like at the moment, there's like about 10 years ago, I'm sure you experienced this in your work, there were very few people doing things, and so you knew about all the things. 
But now loads of people have been doing different things in different sectors and it's really overwhelming. And some people are doing the same thing with a different name or in a different country. And other countries don't know of any of those things and they're trying to do it themselves. So it feels really like at the moment it's about trying to connect together mm. all of these things. And, and that what is what it kind of feels like is happening. These things are kind of coalescing. But I, I spoke to these, these Indian film producers earlier and they told me that, and like Lini, you'll know about this, the UN side of things. So the UN ENSA, the Entertainment Net Zero Accord, that they're now changing to be uh, ECA, which is the Entertainment and Culture Climate Accord. The idea being, they've already done this with sports and they've done this with um, fashion, that you get producers to sign up to an accord, then you're gonna say, this is my intention, these are the things I'm gonna do to reduce, be sustainable, and then you're accountable for that. And I was told this, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true, but apparently H&M got booted off because they said they were going to be fat, like uh, uh, ethical and then they were just greenwashing and so they got booted off by the UN from the accord so there's accountability and real like that's quite a bad thing to happen to your company and I feel like that I'm kind of hoping that what you're seeing on the panel is sort of apart from Steam who represents like an organ like a, a network we're like individuals kind of like budding up through the soil with all our little different ways of doing things but now there's gonna be this, these overarching structures that are gonna help people in places or organizations or sectors who haven't tried this immediately learn from the things we've done and share best practice, uh, rather than it being lots of case studies. Um, you know, so Brilliant. I think that, that, that's where it kind of feels a bit like it's happening. I want it to go faster. Right. Yeah, we yeah. all do. Thank you for that question. That was brilliant. We have to wrap it up now because we're way over, but thank you so much for joining us and a massive round of applause for our team family.